This is Xi Ting welcoming you to Backstage, the life behind the music. This is an online series of conversations with pianists, an exploration of their remarkable artistic lives as performers, teachers, and advocates for music. Through talking, I hope to shed some light on their process, to get a glimpse into some of their music making, the real work that takes place before they or their students step out onto the stage. Thank you for joining me today. I think we have a lot of questions to cover, and I will just start uh, jumping into the first question. I know when you were a kid, you started concertizing by the age of seven. You had a very early start to your career. Can you describe what music meant to you as you were growing up? Well, music was extremely important. I I was lucky to be raised in in a home that was a musical home. My father was a a, a musician, a music teacher. So basically, I cannot remember a time in my life when I was not completely surrounded by music. And like most kids, um, look up to my father, and my father was a musician. So there were instruments at home. Kids were coming to my home to take lessons. It seemed to me that music was just um, a normal fact of life. But there was an there was a, a love for it. So um, very soon, I remember being four or five years old, and there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to be a musician. So it's a little bit of both things, um, the environment, but also a desire for it. My, I do have a sister that was obviously raised in the same household, and, and she did learn music, but she, she didn't make music her career or her love. So it, there was obviously something different about the way I related to music. You have won uh, some prizes in Chopin competition and you have played a lot of Spanish music. Whose music do you feel most close to and why is that? Well, that's a very interesting question. Well, just to make clear, yeah, I have won a few Chopin prizes or prizes that were in Chopin specialized competitions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that my my likes or dislikes for certain music go along with the different times in my life. It's almost impossible to pick one composer or one type of music, but um, I think there is a correlation between what composer I felt closer to and a certain phase or a certain time in my life. When I was a child, the pretty much the only recording that I had was, I remember it was a magnetic um, tape. And um, it was so far through Rubinstein playing Chopin. This is how I basically got exposed to the sound of the piano other than the piano at home. And I listened to that tape again and again and again for thousands of times. So uh, Chopin was my first love in music. Um, then as I grew up and I became a teenager, I discovered Brahms. And I fell deeply in love with the music of Brahms. Then as I uh, matured into a young adult, um, I went through a more sort of virtuoso phase. So I was um, very interested in the music of Rachmaninoff and the music of Scriabin both. Um, then other events happened in my personal life, and when I was in my late 20s, um, I felt the need to some sort of a spiritual and some sort of soul purity. So I, I don't say that I discovered because it was always with me, but I rediscovered Bach. And so I... Bach would became extremely important to me. It had always been, but uh, all of a sudden it took precedence. Um, and, and as I continue to mature, both as a person and, and as, a, as a musician, I wouldn't say that other composers took a different um, place. I think that what happened was that composers that I didn't used to care for, joined the list of composers that were close to me. 
So I think I, I grew up with certain ignorance and certain arrogance. When I was a child, I, I believe it or not, I thought Mozart music was frivolous and, and lightweight. And then when I was a young adult, you know, early teens or early 20s, I was arrogant enough to consider Schubert lacking in craftsmanship as a composer. I thought he has some nice themes, but he has no idea how to develop. See, you, you, you see the ignorance and the arrogance and coming from it from a Brahmsian concept. So Schubert seemed like um, I could take scissors and cut, a, cut a, few, a few pages out of those sonatas and things would be just fine. Yeah, I did grow out of that ignorance and that arrogance. So now I, I both love Mozart and Schubert. Um, and along with many other things that you cannot grow out of, you know? Speaking of Chopin, I know you played for Zimmerman. What was it like? What did you learn from him? Well, my encounter with uh, Christian Zimmerman um, was one of the most important musical events in my life. Um, Christian Zimmerman had been an um, idol of mine uh, since the times I was a student back at the Manhattan School of Music last millennia. And um, so finally I got to meet my, uh, my idol and I had the audacity to actually play um, Chopin's four ballad for him. And, and I was absolutely impressed and floored by his generosity. I, he was in Spain. He was about to play, I think, Bartok third piano concerto with an orchestra. And so I, I went to the concert hall there, which he had asked me to go. And um, I, I thought we would have a conversation or at best I would play and he would just maybe give me a couple of comments. But he actually gave me a three and a half hour lesson. And this is the day before his performance when he was supposed to be trying out the piano and practicing himself. Um, and, and then I, I understood why, why he is a musician of such stature. Um, not only intellectually, he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, but also his, his artistry, his command of the instrument. It was a life-changing experience. So, of course, I have a partial bias, um, opinion of Mr. Zimmerman. I adore his playing. I don't always agree with it, but uh, I adore his playing. And I am extremely thankful that I was the fortunate enough to, to meet such a personality. And not, not just him, I was blessed to have met other great musicians, uh, people like Carl Eister, people like Isaac Perlman, um, Pinka Zuckerman, um, I've just been blessed to be able to be in touch or surrounded by such uh, giants of um, this art. Um, everyone who has ever uh, heard you play um, is struck by your beautiful sound and delicate tone. I still remember you played the uh, Scrab and Sonata in Spain last year. It was so beautiful. I just was wondering how do you cultivate that? How do you... Um, did some someone influence you or did you always have a... Um, specific tone that you're looking for and how did you do that? Hmm. It's a very interesting question. Um, I'm afraid a, a pretty long answer that, that has to accompany that question. Um, as I was growing up in Spain, uh, I was um, aware of certain deficiencies in my piano playing. I had a very brutally honest piano teacher in Spain that um, before he died, um, he said to me, you know, you have certain virtues in your piano playing, but you do have uh, a deficiency in your tone production. So that brought the red alarm, the red alert to my mind, and I set out on a mission to correct that deficiency. So at a certain piano competition, I noticed, listen to the other contestants, that there were two specific contestants that seemed to have a, a sound in the same piano they were projecting a, a sound that was different from the other contestants 
And sure enough, I looked at the program and they both studied with the same teacher. So then I looked at my father who was with me and I said, I want to study with this teacher. Uh, there was something polished, beautiful, um, very communicative about the way they produced Tom. So I did. I, I managed to be able to study with such teachers. That teacher was um, Salomon Mikovsky at the Manhattan School of Music. And um, when I came into the Manhattan School of Music, um, the, the consensus was that um, as an undergrad, um, that I needed to work on precisely that sound. And he was extremely instrumental, not just in pointing at the problem, but in providing the solutions. And I also want to ground him with the, um, the ability to expose me to what now we call as, or we know as the golden age of piano playing. It was listening to the great pianists of the beginning of the 20th century, especially Ignaz Friedman and Beno Moisevich, that I became much more inspired. I had already had the thirst, the need to find a better tone, a better sound. And I have to make a, a, something clear. Um, it's not just this, the, the, the search for a, a pretty sound is the search for an appropriate sound. And sometimes the appropriate sound for the music is actually not pretty at all. But because of the, the type of repertoire that I was uh, embarked on, uh, myself upon, uh, the search for a beautiful tone, what we sometimes call a beautiful tone, was, was an obsession. So I found a lot of inspiration from these amazing pianists, Porto, Rosenthal, Moisevich, Gilles. I started identifying with a certain type of tone that I wanted to produce. Um, and that's a very general, um, general definition. But it was not just, um, it was not just finding it, it was even understanding the process of creating it. Since it was not, or it, it seemed that it was not something natural to me, I had to find a process, I had to find a way. So I, I realized that um, the first thing that was important, and I tried to implement that in my own teaching, is, is that what I call the distinction between a good sound and a magical sound. I think a lot of the times we go about getting a sound or, or finding sound by a negative parameter, we don't want a bad one. So then we are content or we are okay with a good sound, even a pretty good sound. But I'm not really interested in just a good sound. I want something different. I want something memorable. I want something extraordinary. So then I, I was searching for a magical sound, something that, as one of my teachers said in Spain, would make people identify my playing, that in the moment they heard me play, they would say, ah, oh, that has to be him because that's his sound. Mm -hmm. So it was not just for the sake of betterment, but it was identifying in, in it, it was serving the music. Um, so then I, I realized that uh, in order to do that, you need uh, imagination you need to know what a good sound is or what sound you're, you're looking for. Sometimes you find it by yourself. Sometimes your, your teacher inspires it to you. Sometimes you hear it from great pianists of the past or from orchestra pieces. Um, there are many ways, but that imagination is necessary. And then there is that need, that very quite hot need for it. You have to want it. Um, and then, um, I realized that the, the only way to search for that was to realize the, rea the reality in which we are dealing. We are dealing with the most indirect instrument ever. We are very far away from the actual production of the sound. Other 
instruments are much more direct, whether you're bowing or you're breathing into them, or, or, or of course, the, the perfect one, which is the, the human voice. But the piano is, as far as I'm concerned, the very worst of it, because you have this monster, black monster sitting there, and then you just sit at it, and the only part of your body that actually connects with the instrument is your fingers. Uh, and a, a not very substantial point uh, of contact. And then there is a whole mechanism until the sound is actually produced. Because of that, I realized that I needed to create a much more intimate relationship with the instrument, precisely because the instrument is indirect and somewhat mechanical. Yeah, one has to bypass the, the, the mechanical aspect. And, and that's something that Zimmerman actually mentioned in that encounter. And he said, you know, you have to pretend that you're playing on the strings themselves. Bypass the action. Bypass everything. Transcend your reality. And that, that is something that I, I realized had to be done. You know, practicing at the Mahanta School of Music um, back in those days, there were less than desirable instruments to practice on. And I hear a lot of students a lot of the times complaining about, oh, you know, the pianos are not so good. And, and yeah, we, we all like to play in fantastic instruments, but I actually credit some of those experiences in such bad instruments because I took it as a challenge. For me, getting into a piano that even some of the kids did not work, the challenge was, can I still make the best possible sound here? Um, a sound that, that, that is not really possible. And from that point of view, I think that part of what we do in piano playing is belief in the impossible. Like, like Lewis Carroll says, I think at one point in time, Alice and the Queen are talking in Alice in Wonderland. And, and I think the Queen says, oh, I, I, I think you don't have a lot of experience in believing impossible things. I believe in as many as five impossible things every day before breakfast. I think that pianists are magicians. Uh, we're dealing with a very challenging ma machine, and yet we have to believe in the impossible. So I, I transcended the reality that I was into, and I pretended that that instrument that was in front of me was a fantastic piano. I did not uh, give up and just simply, you know, get by. So I think part of that, that need, that obsession, and that is probably what um, might have benefited my search for sound, which, which is a lifelong pursuit. I, I'm still, every time I practice or every time I teach, I'm still looking for that magical, memorable sound. Would you say that you have a teaching philosophy? If you do, can you share it with us? Yeah, well, I think professors, we all have some kind of idea of what, what it is that is important to us. Um, I think there are three aspects. The, the, the first thing that it's like a sine qua non condition, you're dealing with human beings. And, and because you're dealing with human beings, obviously, you have to look at the diversity um, of human beings. And you, every student is a different universe. Every student comes from different backgrounds and has different issues. So you have to somehow customize your teaching to the needs of the student. But then the student itself has three main departments in my view. And there is the pianist, there is the musician, and then there is the artist. Ideally, and I say ideally because sometimes the, the environment in which we are teaching can vary. Sometimes we're just listening to someone online. Sometimes we are at a beautiful setting in a summer festival. And sometimes we are in the grind of week after week after week situation with a student of ours. Those are three different environments and the teaching is not quite the same. 
because you know that there is a time frame there. Uh, and, but but what's, what's true is that you're always dealing with that three part, the pianist, the, the musician and the artist. And sometimes in conservatories or, or, or universities, because of requirements and the structure of degrees and all these things, it's difficult to address the three aspects of it. So for me, it's important to try to um, address the pianist. And what I mean by that is teaching someone how to play the instrument. And that which seems to be much more important at the undergrad level, I, I don't actually subscribe to that idea. I think that teaching how to use the instrument properly and how to have uh, um, the mechanics uh, of your technique in a way that allows you to play until you're 97 without injury, uh, in a way that serves the purpose of the music, in a way that allows, that enables you to express your musical thoughts and your, your artistry. I think that's, that's a never ending process. And, and I respect, respectfully disagree with people that think, oh, well, you know, you have to do that at a certain age. And then after that, um, you're basically done and you, you know, you got what you got. I think that by now, science has disproved this completely. Uh, now we do know that neurological pathways and neurons are still produced um, even uh, as we age. So because of that, the capacity to learn does not diminish as we grow, up, grow old. I think that what, what diminishes is the thirst, the drive, the willpower. Um, but I think that it's perfectly possible to change and to uh, modify one's mechanical approach to the keyboard, no matter the age. I'm not saying it's easy. In many ways to do that, you need to become a different person altogether. And that is never a good thing. I mean, it's never an easy thing. But then uh, there is the musicianship. The musicianship part, I think, is a group effort. We do have in, in conservatories, and, and I'm talking about this age group because that's the age group that I deal with. I'm not talking about children. But you have um, you know, music history professors, music theory professors. Um, a lot of other professors that are somehow informing the student and making the student a more complete musician. I just wish that all the subjects that um, students learn in conservatories and universities were taught in a way, and, and I'm not saying that, that a scholarship is a bad thing, that can be very, very good road for some musicians. But for those that want to perform, um, those subjects uh, sometimes are taught almost as if they live in a vacuum of them, themselves and they have no application to performance. Um, and it is left up to the student's ingenuity to apply those no that knowledge to their performances. I think that um, it's important to make an effort uh, for, for us pedagogically to try to not not teach subjects in vacuums but to try to relate music theory to performance music history to performance acoustics to performance aesthetics to performance in fact um, when one is, is is a pianist one relates every experience in the real world even if it's a non-musical experience, one can relate it to an aspect of music or an aspect of piano playing. Um, so then there is the artistry part of it. And that is um, one that is probably the hardest, especially in the context of a music conservatory and, 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 and in a university. And in many ways, it has to do with the unblocking of the student. The student in order to become an artist, uh, yeah, I, I do agree that there are certain people that perhaps have bigger talent. There is such thing as talent. But I, I, I don't ascribe to the idea that, well, just some people just got it and some people just don't. So 
basically that's it, uh, case closed. I think that's a little bit of a cop-out. I think that before one allows life to make that distinction, uh, one has to realize whether there, um, there might be certain blocks that are preventing the student to fulfilling an artistic aspiration. A lot of those blocks may be physical, but others might be emotional or mental or even sociological. So trying to help the student to release those blocks and, and create freely and become artistically rich, that is probably one of the hardest things that we can address. And it requires a knowledge of the student much more as a human being than just as a musician or as a skillful athlete. Um, unfortunately, there is very little opportunity to actually get to know the student at such deep levels. And of course, then one is dealing with psychology and one is dealing with um, psychological issues, traumas, um, things they learn from society, things they learn from their families, things they learn from the world out there. So there's a lot, a lot of work to do on that and, and to turn them into a performer, which is not just someone who, who is not blocked, but someone who also wants to broadcast, someone who wants to communicate. Um, a part of it has to be done by the student. Part of it has to come from that need. I keep always going back to that, that thirst, that need. But our, our, our job as teachers is to remove those blocks, to allow the students thirst. So I try to, I try to address the three parts, but I'm not so sure that, that I'm always successful. You mentioned that myself have um, experienced stage fright. I'm not sure a lot of uh, my peers, my colleagues have also had that problem. How do you deal with that problem and how do you address it and help your students with it? It's, I think it's a universal um, problem that we have as performers. And um, if anybody tells you that they're, they're not, what we call nervous or anxious before a performance, they're just simply lying to you. I mean, that's, that's uh, and, and one of the things I like to do, there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of literature coming up, um, which I haven't had the time to, to catch up with, but um, there's been more and more research done on this. And um, so I, I don't pretend that I have the ultimate truth. Probably there are people out there much more qualified than me to talk about the mechanisms that go in the brain and why we feel this way. But it's very clear to me that what we call anxiety or what we call nerves or what we call, you know, stage fright, it's, it's basically fear. I mean, what we're dealing is with a very normal um, emotion that we all know very well, fear. And um, so then you have to understand, I think you have to combat fear basically. And um, there are certain antidotes for fear. Um, one of them is knowledge. Uh, we fear what we don't know. So what, what, what do we fear? We fear the, the uncertainty of the situation. Uh, we, we have practiced, we have worked, but the reality is that we have one time to perform and that's it. We don't have a second choice. We don't have a second chance, right? It's it. So, and we don't know what's gonna happen. That not knowing, it's part of it. Uh, so we, what we do is we try to mitigate this as much as possible, uh, we, we practice. We, we have to go on stage mm, with the knowledge that, yes, it's never going to be perfect. We have to accept that. The same way a samurai accepted death could happen every single day. You have to say, yes, there is a chance that it might be a disaster, that today might be not my day. So you have to kind of like accept that because that's a fact of life. It's like accepting that tomorrow the sun is going to come up. 
you better accept it. It's gonna happen. But once you accept it, then you have to do your very best to make that experience recognizable. So when you practice, you can even practice in, in, in your practice room, putting yourself under the pressure of an imaginary situation where you are performing. You can record yourself and realize that, okay, that's it. I don't, I can't stop. I can't go back and fix it. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create mental processes that are somewhat familiar. And this is also the reason why some artists have rituals and things that they do. They wear these socks or they have coffee or they have a shot of vodka or they like to have chocolate before. What, what they're doing is they're establishing a certain routine because they think that, that that routine is going to produce the same positive result that produced the other 25 times. It's a way of basically denying the uh, complete uncertainty of the performance act. The reality is that we don't have that certainty. We will never have it. And that's not entirely a bad thing because that, that adrenaline that we feel because of fear and because the excitement of the situation is charging our music making. So we, we shouldn't really take it completely away. But what we have to learn to do is to control it. And here, therein lies the problem. So you try to practice to feel as ready as possible. And I stress the words as possible. You will never find com yourself completely ready. But you do your very best. Definitely, if you know you've done your homework, you're going to wa walk on the stage with a different kind of confidence. But then you need other antidotes of fear. And the other antidotes of fear are things that are things like faith. Things like, things like hope. Hope and faith are historically antidotes against fear. And I'm not talking about religious faith, although for some people that might be helpful too. I'm talking about faith in general, faith in yourself, faith in your instruction, faith in your teacher, faith in your preparation, faith in the fact that people are there not to judge you, that people are actually sitting there hoping to have a good time. They're actually expecting you to, you to do your best, not your worst. And they're not going to punish you. You're, there is not going to be any body harm. I mean, hopefully, there is not going to be any bodily harm coming to you from a bad performance. The only thing that is really going to get bruised if you don't have a good performance is your ego, is your sense of self. And that's because we pianists have a tendency to equate our sense of self-worth with how well we perform, how well we play, or how well we think we play. And then we, we seek that external validation from the audience and from our colleagues. We want people to tell us, yes, you're, you're doing great. You're, 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 you're. The reality is that the validation is irrelevant. Uh, what we're doing is about the music. It's not about our ego. The ego is not I guess it's unavoidable, but it's not, what I say to my students, it's not about you. It's about the music. You know, after, after we are gone from this planet, the music will still be there. I, I will be gone and Chopin will still be Chopin. It doesn't matter whether I play right or wrong. Or it's, it's like in, in six, 65 years from now, I'll be gone and people will still listen to Chopin and people will still play Chopin. So that's, you know, faith is important. Um, and then the other, the other antidote that I find is, is humor. Um, humor is important too, and I'm not precisely the greatest person to talk about that one, but realizing the, um, the, the situation is not quite as serious, that, that the threat is not as serious. It's uh, that to laugh a little bit about your yourself and, and the situation, to find the fun of it, I think is also important. But ultimately, I always come to one uh, quote from, from a movie. Um, I think it's the movie's called After Earth. No, it has Will Smith in it. 
And um, there is one quote that kind of stuck in my mind and I like to tell it to my students. He says, uh, at one point uh, says, uh, danger is real, fear is a choice. It's how you react. Yeah, you acknowledge that the danger is real. And that's where you're gonna feel that adrenaline. You're, you're gonna feel that. And you shouldn't freak out because that's part of it. That's the experience, that's the energy. Yes, there is a danger. You acknowledge that there is danger, but now you have a choice. How do you acknowledge that? Do you let yourself be controlled by that or do you use it? And then why would you use it? What it, what it is that you mean by performing? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to offer the very best of yourself and the very best of music to other human beings. If you're offering a gift, if you're offering the best possible gift, what are you afraid of? Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It's very hard to stay motivated at a time like this with so much uncertainty ahead of us, but it's so wonderful to hear you talk about all these issues and get inspired. And I hope to play for you again. I miss playing for you. And I hope like, we can see each other again sometime soon in Spain or here. Yeah. Hopefully the situation will get better. Yeah. And uh, we will go back to some sort of uh, warmer interaction. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Take care. You too.